Hey, Victory, we are so excited that you are at church this weekend. If I haven't got the chance to meet you, my name is Paul Doherty. I'm the pastor along with my wife, Ashley. During the month of July, we took some time away, but we are coming back next weekend. I've got a word in store for you. Can't wait to see you. But this weekend, we are blessed with an incredible guest speaker. And I love this guy. In fact, this guy has never preached to our weekend church. He has come and preached years ago to our young adults. I know you're gonna love him. His name is Reggie Dabbs. Now let me say something about Pastor Reggie Dabbs. When my father passed away, I went on a missions trip to Australia. I went to go preach to some people and I was flying back and I'm standing in the airport in Australia, far back in a line, two hour long wait. And this guy who I've never met taps me on the shoulder and he says, do I know you? I said, I don't know. I think I know you because I've seen you on stages before. At that time, I remember seeing Reggie Dabbs preach on big stages to thousands of people. So I knew who he was and I was shocked that he thought he knew who I was. He said, I know you, you're Billy Joe Doherty's son. He said, why are you standing in the back of the line? He said, come with me. And that day, Reggie moved me from the back of the line, a two hour long wait to the front of the line, took me into first class lounge, treated me like I was one of his own sons, blessed me, showed me favor. I said, I don't deserve this. I'm like Mephibosheth. He said, no, son, you are a child of God and you're a child of a mighty uh, man of God, Billy Joe Doherty, who made an impact on my life. I'll never forget that. It's such, a, it's such an honor to have him with us this weekend, now pouring into our church. And I believe he's got a word in store for you. He's got an incredible testimony. All right. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? It's good to be in church, amen. Hey, do me a favor, touch your neighbor and say, I'm glad you came today. Now, I know some of y'all looking at me like, why am I talking to my neighbor? Because, see, I was born in Tennessee, and I live in South Florida, so you got a black Southern preacher up in the house today. And I'm going to be honest, I'm being as white as I can right now. So it ain't going to last much longer. So just in case you uh, don't remember the Medea movies, here's how you act when there's a black preacher. Number one, you got to talk to your neighbor. So touch your neighbor and say, all right, all right, all right. Number two, you got to talk to the preacher. Somebody say, come on, Reggie. And number three, just have a good time. It's going to be a good time. Now, look, I made a, I'm making a promise. I'm going to make a promise to y'all right now. We are going to beat the Baptist to the buffet today. I'm sick of the Baptist getting all the white meat and the chicken. I ain't doing that today. I woke up this morning and said, Jesus, please help us beat the Baptist to the buffet line. <laughs> It's sad, I know, I'm sorry. Your pastor gonna be back next week, okay? I'm not just a speaker, I'm a saxophone player. That's a soprano saxophone. Is it all right? Can I do a little Southern music for y'all? Somebody say, I'm blessed. Come on, say, I'm blessed.
All right, all right, all right. Go ahead and sit down if you can. If you can't, that's all good. Every time I play saxophone, I sweat. My son go, dude, every time you play, you sweat. Why? I say, it's easy. Because I don't know when my last song is going to be. So I play each song as if it's my last. I don't know when my last sermon is going to be. So I preach each sermon as if it's my last. Now look, I'm going to be honest, y'all. I don't, I don't get to do this often. Uh, 80% of what I do is uh, not in church. Uh, 80% of what I do is in the public realm. Uh, CNN News says I'm the number one communicator to young people in the world. I speak face to face to 1.5 million young people every year in public schools. I'm a motivational speaker in public schools is what I do. Over the last few sessions this weekend, I've had teachers come up and go, oh my goodness, I didn't know you did this. Because in public schools, you're not able to say Jesus. So I'm undercover. <laughs> now the gig is up. There's a lady who's a math teacher, and she, she's at Broken Arrow High School. She looked at me this morning and went, oh my goodness, I should have known. <laughs> I spoke at Broken Arrow this past February, did their entire student body, and it was fun. And, and this coming year, I'll be back again unless they figure this out. <laughs> but it's too late because they love me. <laughs> Now listen, today, today, uh, you, you got to understand, the, the days of the week are pretty cool. You got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now here's the cool thing. With those seven days of the week, every preacher spends all their time on two of those days. It's either Friday or Sunday. Word? Which I understand. Friday, the day Jesus died for the sin of the world. If it wasn't for that Friday, whew, we wouldn't be here today. If it wasn't for that Friday, there'd be no hope. There'd be no chance. Because of that Friday, everything's possible. And everybody speaks on Sunday, the day Jesus rose from the grave with the keys to death, hell, and the grave so that we can be victorious over whatever you messed up in, you can win when Jesus, all right? I like it when people look at me and say, well, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, God can't save me. Literally, he's like, I've been too bad, I'm too bad. Seriously, if you that bad, then the devil would have used whatever that bad was on Jesus to keep him in the grave. But I don't know if you heard the news. That tomb empty, and it ain't fake news. That's a real one right there, all right? That brother's back. Somebody touch your neighbor and say, all right, all right, all right. Now, I know some of y'all super spiritual. You're looking down here like, oh, we know that, but you don't understand. You know what I'm saying? I ain't here to talk about Friday. I ain't here to talk about Sunday. Those are great days. But I've decided to preach a simple sermon called um, uh, Silent Saturday. <laughs> Silent Saturday. That's where we're going. Now, there's a couple of places in the Bible you got to turn to. First of all, get your Bible and just put your finger on this one, and then we're going to come back a little bit later. But get your Bible. Go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. All right? Matthew 11, 28, 29. Go ahead and shout for the word of God. That's good right there. Once you get there, Matthew 11, 28 and 29, get your other finger and go to Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Luke chapter 7, verse 11. And everybody say, all right, all right, all right. So that's it, that's it. Here's the way it goes. Now here's the deal, here's the deal. This whole thing about Silent Saturday is crazy. Because if we go back, Jesus spoke on Friday. I mean, that Friday when he took the sin of the world on his shoulders and he hung on that cross and died, he spoke literal words like, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That spoke so much that one of the thieves says, Jesus, remember me. You know what's great about Jesus? He started his whole ministry as a man on earth by reaching and saving the lost. And the last thing he did as a man on earth is reach and save a thief. That means anybody's redeemable. Everybody's savable. Everybody can be changed when Jesus steps in the picture. Somebody say amen. Am I starting to good? I'm, I'm slowing. Y'all looking at me like, oh, he going at it. Oh, no. I'm still white. <laughs> I am calming myself down in my head. My wife told me to be careful. She said, behave. I said, I will try. 
But the more I speak, you don't understand. I'm not saying this stuff just because it's my job. I'm letting you know where I came from. If it wasn't for Jesus in my life, I would not be here today. I'm not preaching on something that I learned in school, though I did go to school, so I got my education. But I'm preaching on what changed this brother's life and made it possible for me to still be breathing today. I am 55 years old. I look good because black don't crack. But I'm here to tell you today, that is. I tried to keep it out of the room. It just slipped up and bit me right there. It's too late now. I'm black now, so I'm just going to go back here, get my hanky, and just start preaching, all right? Friday, 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 when Jesus hung his head and died, he spoke volumes. Then Sunday, his actions spoke louder than his words. When he came out of that grave with the keys of death, hell, and the grave, winning victorious forever, the devil knew he was done when Jesus came out of that grave. So on Friday, he spoke. On Sunday, but Saturday, nothing, nothing. As dead as a cadaver body that he was. God spoke on Friday. Boy, did he speak. When he allowed his son to die for you and me, he spoke. And when his son died, he took the son away. That's speaking right there. Not to mention, and some of y'all don't remember this one. When Jesus died, God shook the ground so violently that the dead people in the cemetery came back to life. Word. I'd hate to be the dude who married his best friend's wife after he died, though. <laughs> that is a Lifetime Channel movie right there. <laughs> Guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just saying, let it go, y'all. Let it go. Let it go. One little boy touched his mom and said, is that in the Bible? <laughs> God spoke. When he took the veil in the temple and he tore it from top to bottom. Somebody like, what's the big deal? Oh, no. Up until that moment, you had to go to some holy man and tell him what you did wrong so he could step into the presence of God and get you forgiveness. But when Jesus died for the sin of the world, there was no middle man anymore. Nah, -uh, you come just as you are. You come walking up to God with all the hurt and the sorrow and the disappointments, and he'll hear your plea. And not only that, he already answered it. He did it in his son. Even if you don't believe he died for you, on Sunday, God spoke, said to his son, get up. And that brother got up. But on Saturday, nothing. Some of you are English people, and you're like, no, it's nothing. Uh-uh, it nothing. Because if you got nothing, you still got I-N-G. But when you ain't got nothing, you pull with no R. That's as country as it's going to get right there, y'all. Nothing. Nothing. Jesus silent on Saturday. The woman anointed his body, placed him in Joseph's borrowed tomb. The cadaver of Christ is as mute as the stone that's guarding it. And here, that's it. The reason why I'm speaking on silent Saturday is that's where we live. Some of you, even though the seven days of the week go by in 24-hour periods, you're still stuck in Saturday. The day after the miracle and the day before the answer. So here's what I got. I got definition for Silent Saturday. I got to make sure everybody's with me on this. You got to all go with me on this. So let me give you the definition of Silent Saturday. It, it, it just go like this. Mm. Like you had some of that mashed potatoes and brown gravy from KFC. Go, mmm. Now, if I say it really good, you got to go, mmm, to say you agree with it. Watch this. This is what Silent Saturday is. It's the day after the struggle and the day before the solution. The day after the question and the day before the answer. The day after the prayer and the day before the miracle. The day after the addiction and the day before you set free. The day after you get lost and the day before you found. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about? If it hasn't happened in your life, this is a good day for you. I'm just saying. But you know what? That Saturday is silent. It torments us. It, 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 it just eats away at our insides. We start saying things like this. Is God angry with me? Did I disappoint him? God knew Jesus was in the tomb. Why doesn't he do something? Or in our case, you notice how I said our? 
I ain't nothing special. You'll find that out in a few minutes. That's why I don't even call myself Pastor Reggie. It's cool. I did the education, but I'm just, I'm not that guy. I'm just not that guy. I don't need a title. I barely let people know my name's Reggie. I want to leave a room and people go, who was that? And when can I meet him again? <laughs> That's the kind of guy I am. I'm just saying. After this service, some of you are like, where's Reggie? I'm right there in the lobby shaking hands with everybody who comes through that door. Why? Because you need to understand, it is what it is, y'all. We all just a beggar trying to tell another beggar where to get a meal. I'm just a blind man showing another blind man how he can see again. I'm just a cripple showing another cripple that Jesus can help you walk again. In the middle of your hurt and pain, he's here. But it torments us Saturdays. They hurt us Saturdays. We start th saying things that are crazy. God knew Jesus was in the tomb. Why didn't he do something for him? God knows that my career's messed up. God knows that my children are nasty. God knows my marriage is in them. What is he going to do for me? When will he answer me? I'm here to tell you, we got to do what Jesus did. What did Jesus do on that Saturday? That particular Saturday. Three things. Number one, everybody say this. Lie still. Oh, come on, say it again. Lie one more time, say it again. Lie Number two, everybody say, be silent. be silent. Now look, don't look at your neighbor and say that, because sir, if you say that to your wife, there'll be another crucifixion right now. <laughs> one is enough in our lifetime, all right? Everybody say, lie still. Lie still. Say, stay silent. stay silent. And say, trust God. Acts chapter 2, verse 27. You will not abandon me in the grave, nor will you let the Holy One see decay. He knew God was coming through for him. He didn't know when. He didn't know how. But he trusted and knew that God would do it. Today, trust him and know he'll do it for you. You may not feel it. You may be hurt. You may be waiting for a doctor's report. Be still and know that he is God. Jesus knew God would not leave him alone in that grave. And you need to know God will not leave you alone in your struggle. His silence is not his absence. His inactivity is not apathy. Apathy ain't even in his vocabulary. He loves you. It's why he gave his son to die for you. Somebody touch somebody beside you and say, I think it was a good day to come to church. Saturdays have their purpose. They let us know the full force of God's strength. Had God raised Jesus 15 minutes after he had died, we would not appreciate that act. Were he to solve our problems seconds after they appear, we would not appreciate his strength. For this reason, God inserted a Saturday after a Friday and before Sunday. In James 5, 7, it says, be patient, my brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. Now turn there and let me read it to you. It says, come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Look at Micah 7, 8. Watch this. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Did y'all get this? Look up at her. Look up on the screen. Look at that again. Just put that scripture up there one more time. It says, though I have fallen, I will rise again. Get back up again. Yeah. Somebody hit your neighbor and say, get up. Yeah. Quit your crying. I, I, I hate it when people cry all the time. Like you ain't never, you're the only one ever been hurt. What is wrong with you? Now some of you are looking up here like, oh, what do you got? What do you got? When have you ever fallen? What do you got? I'll tell you. And I'm only telling you this so you'll know who's speaking to you. And once you understand where I'm from, you're going to understand the enthusiasm and the way I just like, hey, is this weird? <laughs> we got to go way back. I was eight years old. Eight years old in school, we had this thing called parent-teacher conference. I hate parent-teacher conference. Clap your hands if you hate parent-teacher conference. <laughs> Worst thing ever. Worst thing ever. <laughs> ever. Dude, some of y'all really hated it. <laughs> My name was the first one on the list, which means I'm the worst kid in the class. Both mom and dad showed up, sit down, five minutes with the teacher. I knew I was dead. When we walked out of the classroom, I noticed something, though. All my friends' parents, all my friends are with their parents, and their parents are all young. But my parents are, like, old. And I'm thinking to myself, why are they old? So in the car going home, I'm in the back seat, they're in the front seat. So I just yelled to the front seat, Hey! Why y'all? 
Don't ever do this. Hey, little girl, look at me. Don't ever do that, all right? <laughs> Just keep it to yourself. When we got home, my dad said, we got to talk. So they put me at the kitchen table to have a talk. Have you ever been to the kitchen table to have a talk? If you haven't, don't go. <laughs> look at me, little girl. If you don't smell food, run, girl, run, okay? <laughs> They'll catch you later. My dad started. My dad was like, son, there's a plan for your life. I'm like, yes, sir. My mom looked at me and said my favorite word. She said, baby, I like that. I'm telling y'all, man, when I was little, I thought my mama was magic, y'all. Every time she said, baby, my darkest night had a light. My cloudiest day had sunshine. No matter what I was going through, I could make it because mama said, baby. I know y'all like big old black men love his mama. <laughs> and yes. My mama said, baby, I'm sorry. And she started crying. My mama cried so hard that my dad moved chairs to hold my mom. After 10 minutes, my dad said, tell him, baby. You got to tell him. My mom looked up and she said, baby, I'm sorry. I'm old because I'm not your mom. And my dad whispered, I'm not your father. You're in a program called foster care. And all of a sudden, it's Saturday. See, Saturdays creep up on you. You don't see them coming. You can be in the morning going, this is the best day of my life. And by that night, you think the world's better off without you. Hey, the world got a reality check a couple of weeks ago when a girl with her name on a backpack or a, a purse takes her own life and then a man on TV takes his life the same week. All of a sudden, everybody's like, what's going on? Everybody blamed it on mental health, but then Time Magazine that week said, maybe it's not just mental health, maybe it has to do with this. And this is what Time Magazine said. Maybe there's something in an average person's life that comes up against them out of nowhere that puts them in a place where they think they can't make it. Then we need to figure this out. Time Magazine said, you, if you come up against something you cannot handle, bigger than you, stronger than you, faster than you, then you need to find something to put into your life that is bigger and stronger than what's coming. I don't know who the dude that wrote that was, but I could tell him who he should be talking about. Because listen, hey, hey, Jesus put it in the Bible. He said, no weapon formed against you will prosper. He put it in the Bible. He said, you're going to be all right. He says, I'm with you. Hey, in John 16, 33 says, I've told you these things. So that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In John 14, 1, he said this, trust in God, trust also in me. Now, you got to do it today. I wonder who's here. I wonder who's struggling. In a room this big, I wonder who wants to die. Because that was me. She said, my mom said, you have a brother. His name's Keith. You have two sisters, Annette and Jeanette. Your mom kept your brother. She kept your sisters. But she said that you were a mistake. And she hated the day that you were born. Baby, I'm sorry. She said, she said, you need to understand your mom's husband left her two days before they were evicted from their home. They lived in an abandoned farm in a chicken coop. Your mom slept with a man for $20 to get food for your, your brother and sisters. You're the result of the $20. Are you all right? I said, I'm fine. You know why I said I'm fine? Every boy wears a mask. In this room, go ahead and act like no big deal. Go ahead and do it. Because you ain't nothing but Naaman. You know Naaman? He was the, like, the hero. He was the warrior. The Bible says that even the king loved Naaman. But it said, but he had leprosy. Underneath the armor, underneath the glitz and the gold, he was dying. Underneath it all, he was rotting from the top down. And the only place he could take off his armor was at home. Some of you got your armor on, but listen to me, my brother. Your mask will fall. And when it does, you need to know what to do. Now, ladies, it's real simple but different for you. So, girls, let me just put this as ghetto as a brother can. Baby, there's hurt and pain, and it's coming after you. There's a Saturday, and it's coming after you. And Mac and Clinique don't make a makeup to cover that kind of pain. So my sister, when everything starts running, and my brother, when your mask falls, you need Jesus. Because he's bigger, stronger, faster, more powerful than anything that this world can ever stick you on a Saturday in. He can do it. He can do it. At eight years old, I said, I'm tired. I, I want to go to bed. They hugged me. I went to my room, and that was the first night the voice in my head said, 
Nobody loves you. You should kill yourself. From 8 to 21, I was highly suicidal. But like I said, I'm 55. You know why? I found something bigger. I found something stronger. I found something more powerful to get me through my silent Saturday. And let me show you what's going to get you through yours. I had to find in the Bible something that can put everybody together to help you really understand what this silent Saturday looks like. So if you go to Luke chapter 7, verse 11, it's a simple story with four verses in the Bible that's going to make this Sunday morning make it good. I publicly want to thank Pastor Paul for letting me come and be at Victory. It's so good. When I was growing up, I watched your founding pastor on TV a lot. When I started ministry, one of the first times I was ever on Christian television, your founding pastor, he interviewed me. I loved the way he preached, the way he painted pictures with his words. Some of you know this. And to be able to just, hey, I didn't just take his son to the front of the line. His son was in the front of the line. His family was in the front of the line. Because you're only as tall as the shoulders you have to stand on. And a pastor like him has such big shoulders that even his sons get to stand on. And I'm going to speak to you as a church. You need to hold on. You thought you were doing good. You're about to get catapulted into a whole new realm of reaching people, loving people, saving people who are stuck in their silent center. Your conference, you need to come because that's the benchmark. This church is never going to look the same by the end of August. And it's all because God's about to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Okay, here we go. I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to explain it. Then I want to pray for you. I love the song you guys sing. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe you'll do it again. But see, when you're stuck in Silent Saturday, you forget the last mountain that he moved. Because all you can see is the one in front of you. But this is going to put everybody on the same page on Silent Saturday. It goes like this. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. Look at verse 12. As he approached the town gate, everybody look at me. If you're not looking at me, look at it on the screen. This is important, all right? Verse 12. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Look at it, look at it, look at it. Say it with me. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Just one more time. Say it out loud. Go. Here's what this means. She'd been there before. She'd walked behind a coffin before. She'd buried her prince before. She begged God to help her get to the grave before. But the first time, she had something to hold on to. She had a son. He looked like dad. He walked like dad. He talked like dad. Every now and then, he would put his other hand on top of hers and go, Mama, it's okay. Mama, I'm going to take care of you. Mama, it's going to be all right. But this time, she had nothing. There was no one. Everything was gone. Why, why, why? Why would he do this? Why would God do this to me? Why would this happen to me? And she had no idea in the middle of her hurt, in the middle of the sorrow, in the middle of walking behind this coffin. She had no idea. Don't y'all get it? I'm nothing but the biggest, blackest Hallmark greeting card from heaven you will ever see in your entire life. And if you read this, it simply says, everything's gonna be all right. Everything is going to be all right. Let's finish this. Verse 13, I love this. The Bible says, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Okay, let's stop. When the Lord saw her, the Lord didn't see the crowd. The Lord didn't see the coffin. The Lord didn't see the funeral. 
All the Lord saw was a woman who was stuck in Saturday, who thought nobody cared anymore, who thought nobody saw her, who thought nobody was with her, who thought she was by herself, who thought she was all alone. There's somebody in this service right now. You think you're by yourself. You think you're all alone. You think there's nobody there, but all oh, heaven is here. And Jesus said to her, just two words, don't cry. Don't cry. And Jesus says to you, don't cry. Watch this, verse 14. He walked up to the coffin and he touched it. And the man carrying the coffin stood still. I love this, y'all. They're called pallbearers. When normal people die, there's two on one side, two on the other, three on one side, three on the other. When I die, there'll be 28 brothers sweating. <laughs> begging God to help him, all right? I'm sorry. Even, even at that moment, I got to be funny. It's just, it's just who I am. So the Paul Bear, they got the coffin here, and they're, they're walking. And Jesus comes up and touches the coffin, and watch this. They can't move. It says they stood. So they're trying to do their job. They can't move. Oh, my goodness. I just thought of something. Some of you are just trying to do your job. But you don't realize Jesus wants to interrupt your normal. He wants to touch something. And the only way he can do that is to get you just to slow down and stop. See, and, and at this moment, you're stopped. You can't move. And they were like, I can't. And I always wondered, why did Jesus do that? Why did he do that? Then it hit me. Because the next thing he does, he leans down and he says to the dead boy, young man, get up. And the boy sit up and started talking. That's why Jesus touched the coffin and made the dudes freeze. Because if he hadn't, they'd have dropped the boy, broke his leg. Then Jesus would have to heal the boy's leg before he does at the end. At the very end, it says, the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. He wants to give you your Sunday back. He wants to give you your joy back. He wants to give you your peace back. He wants to give it back to you. He wants to give it back to you. And today's the day. Today's the day. Listen to this. You sung this. Listen. Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail If you're stuck in Silent Saturday and you need God to move in your life, let me explain to you why I do what I do. Everything has a purpose. I always make people move. That's a physical thing when you move. But watch this. Spiritual is pray. When you pray, it's a very spiritual thing. But when you move and pray, then you're doing something physical with spiritual. You know what that does? It opens up the door for the supernatural to take place in your life. And then that changes everything. So that's why I do that. So here's it. It's real simple. If you're here and you're going to silent Saturday, you're stuck in Saturday. You're stuck in the hurt. You're stuck in the pain. I'm not gonna, you don't have to walk for it. All you gotta do is get enough Jesus in you to stand up. You're going, you got 15 seconds, 14, 13. You're going through it. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, good, 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 good. And hey, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for all of you. Um, I'm trying not to do this, but I got to. Um, if you are... If you're suicidal, Pastor AJ, come right here. Pastor Sharon, could you come just right here? If you're suicidal, I believe life can come. You'll never, ever go back there again. But I'm gonna give you 25 seconds to run to pastor, all right? You're suicidal. You just, you just, you just, I want to die. 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18. Come on, come on, come on. 17. Some of you are like, what am I doing? Don't think about it. Come on, come on. 12, 11, 10, 10, 9. This is life and death, church. Come on, this is life and death. This is life and death. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 
four, three, There's room at the cross for you. You don't do this every day, y'all, but you got to do what you got to do. One, I love sleeping on airplanes, and if I didn't do that, God wouldn't let me sleep. Stretch your hand. Hey, could you do me a favor, too? There are people standing who are in Silent Saturday. Can you jump up and put your hand on somebody? And if your whole row's standing, put your hand on the person beside you. That's pastor said, we're family, y'all. We're family. We're in this thing together. Can you do it just for a second? Just lay hands on somebody. If you ain't got no, if everybody's seating beside you, stretch your hands toward these. Life, this is life right here. This is life right here. This is where it begins. Jesus, we pray. Let your Holy Spirit touch them. God, change their situation. Do what you did for us. God, bring them into Sunday today. In the middle of their hurt, God, be their, be their peace. In the middle of their war, be a shelter, God. Touch them, I pray right now. Touch them, I pray right now. Healing in Jesus' name. God, change yesterday. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Everybody hug somebody and say, everything's going to be all right. Tell them everything's going to be all right. Tell them everything's going to be all right. Hey, can you do me a favor? Watch this. Hey, do me a favor. Right before pastor comes, can I ask you something today? Do you know him? Do you know my king? Do you know my savior? Maybe you came to church and you're like, I don't understand. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, his, his son. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, the Bible says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I can't let you go home before we do this. And y'all ready? It's only 1218. Baptists don't get out until 1235. We got this, y'all. We got this. I love white chicken. It's going to be good, y'all. I got this. But before we do that, you need to give your life to Jesus. You've fallen and you haven't gotten back up yet. Hey, in Revelation chapter 2, it says, remember the height from which you have fallen. Go back and do what you did at first. Hey, listen, there's nothing you can do that God can't save you from, but it's your free will that makes that salvation come to you. Make your free will now. We're all doing it together. Saint, help the sinner. This is a sinner's prayer. You know if you walked into this church with sin in your life, but you don't have to leave the way you came in Jesus' name. Say this with me. Everybody say, Jesus, forgive me. I know I've done wrong, but with my mouth, I confess you, Jesus, are the Son of God. Show me how to live for you. Show me how to love you every day. And in Jesus' name, I'm saved. I'm saved. Thank God Almighty, I'm saved today. Amen and amen, amen. Hey, I pray the message encouraged you, ministered to you, challenged you, and inspired you to go live your life for Jesus. Make it count for eternity. If today's message spoke to you, please leave a comment below how we can be praying for you, how it encouraged you. We'd love to hear from you. Love to celebrate what God's doing in your life. Also, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure you go do that. Click on your notifications so you can find out every time we upload new sermons. Also, if you're interested in giving and being a part of what we're doing to reach our city and reach the world, your generosity can make a huge difference in this ministry. And so we invite you to do that. There's a link to do that right from our website at victory.com. You could go there and give online and help us reach more people with the gospel. Again, we love you. Your best days are right in front of you.